three, two, one. We're live today. I'm with Magdalena. How are you, Magdalena? I'm good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So, uh, we have launch today. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> So what? So maybe 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 let's let's lead with that. So what happened? So what? Uh, Canadian what? The yeah, first time, uh, Canadians, but also anyone internationally that has access to the Toronto Stock Exchange and the stocks and ETFs that trade on it, um, are for the first time able to buy Bitcoin in an ETF, and that's very different from the products that are out there right now, like Three IQ's Bitcoin Fund or Grayscale Trust. Um, Galaxy I and Galaxy have another fund that recently launched. Uh, because it because it's continuously buying and selling Bitcoin and, and issuing units and redeeming them. And so it's much closer going to track uh, to the net asset value of the Bitcoin that they're holding. And they are holding Bitcoin, which is awesome. Um, and so um, before what we've seen is these big premiums because these closed end funds would issue a certain set of units. Um, and, and then every now and then, or, or during the initial uh, uh, IPO, uh, and, and so um, that, the, that premium would represent demand for these extra units because you know, people could, for example, put them in tax advantaged accounts, um, or they were an institutional buyer that could only hold certain types of products. So it's awesome to see this launch. Everyone in our industry has been waiting for an ETF for so many years, and, and you know, 2021, is the year we get one. Uh, and um, I wouldn't be surprised if the US gets one too. There's a few uh, in the pipeline there, Van Eck and Val Valkyrie, for example. And so, so I think I'm very optimistic about this year. Uh, okay, so, you know, I, I mean, this is a bit of a different format than usual, which is fine. <laughs> I don't have, I don't like formats too much anyways, but I, I think this is super relevant. So let, let's chat about it a bit more because- This is actually super, yeah. I think it's relevant. I think, I mean, for me, at least it's, it's top of mind. And I think about it, which I, okay. So in, in essence, what you're saying is, is that there is now a Bitcoin ETF in North America, yes. right? Okay. It's not in the United States. It's in Canada, but quick question. And also, will it Canada, be Canada is back on the stage. And I think in some ways we've redeemed ourselves after the Quadriga debacle, right? That was one of the biggest things that recently happened in Canada. And so now we have an ETF and the industry is moving forward and it's professional and it's doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, and there's obviously, you know, like normal brokerages and exchanges and then the, the three IQs. And I mean, Canada yeah. just seems like it's- We're it's a long like, way away from Gerald Cotton, CEO of Quadriga, who's running the exchange on his laptop. <laughs> So that was one topic that we were going to maybe, I was going to go into a bit more. What, what, what was your role again with kind of some of that? Like, I remember you helped on, on some fronts, right? With the whole quadruple. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I have been appointed, uh, bleh. <laughs> I've been appointed by the Supreme Court of Nova Scotia to, in, to wear two different hats. Um, one is to be an inspector of the bankruptcy. There's five inspectors. And what we do is we provide direction to the monitor or, sorry, to the trustee that oversees the bankruptcy and distribute funds. So we provide um, direction, for example, if they have any, uh, um, let's say, you know, um, Gerald bought a bunch of properties and um, like cars, planes, houses, which is very illegal to do and it's fraud because he took creditor funds. And so, you know, for example, when we were selling these assets to put them into cash form to be then later distributed to effective users, um, you know, we would provide advice on pricing and, and all sorts of other things that we provide advice and direction on, including, um, you know, for example, there's a bunch of um, Ethereum locked up and it's kind of like, what are the odds that, that Gerald just, he had terrible code um, and 67, uh, 1000 ETH was lost, which is $150 million. Um, and so, you know, we provide kind of, we point these kinds of things out, for example, to, to players that might not have been in the space for so long or fully understand the impact of things but, like that. Uh, um, I was going to say on that note, so you said 150 million US dollars. 150 million US dollars have been back locked then. Up. Oh, sorry. Oh, been now, locked up. now. So it was back then. Value. Um, I, I, maybe $20 million, 67,000 ETH is about 150 million Canadian. It's considering only about $40 million worth uh, has been recovered of, of the over 200 million. Um, in, in a way, that's almost the best chance 
for victims to kind of be closer to being made whole because uh, they're getting you know pennies on the dollar and it's really interesting to see um what's the total that- amount What's the total amount? What's the total amount? Like, because you're talking about Ethereum right now, but what was the total amount that was- Total amount of- lost um, in terms of claims. It's over $200 uh, million dollars, uh, at the time. Right now- ah. Oh my goodness. Oh, what is it today? No, I actually, I monitor the current prices and last oh, time it was like $1.8 billion. Bah. Oh my yeah, Lord. Like the prices ha. have gone up. That's how much is <laughs> gone. Like- Okay, so so okay, so and to people people who do know don't know because we kind of just dove right into the weeds. We did dive in. Okay. So okay. so 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 there was a what? Like there was a company okay, called so Quadriga. Quadriga yeah. Is the Tiger King of crypto story? We have a CEO that we, died. We probably shouldn't smile while we tell it. Let, let's put on a little bit of All a right, serious. Thing. Well, I mean, it's shit. I lost money too. So yeah, it's, it's sad. It's super yeah. sad. Um, and I have friends who lost money and or people who had to close businesses couldn't do their startup. Like it is a totally shitty situation. Um, and so, so Gerald died in India and then there's some funny, like interesting things that we learned about his death where, you know, he went to, sorry, his body, uh, got taken from the hospital to the hotel, brought back to the hospital. The hospital said, uh, uh-uh, uh, this is not standard procedure. So then it went to a medical hospital where the director, um, there had been uh, a few months back, um, charged for, for, uh, I, I know there was some some fraud that happened there anyways really weird but the point is you know um when he died we first heard that in, no one had access to the cold wallets and those are the wallets that you know very securely tend to store typically on an exchange all the crypto and but actually when when more investigations came out the Ontario Securities Commission did a really good job in, um, in, in publicly uh, revealing what actually had happened and it was kind of worse because if he embezzled, that's one thing. Because like, for example, the homes, we could recover them and sell them. But the crypto was gone because he took it to other exchanges and did a shit job of trading, like margin trading, and he lost. He was not a good trader. So most of the money is gone because of poor decisions that he made. And so it's kind of like a story of, you know, we had Mt. Gox in, uh, what was it, 2014, 13, that when it went down. Um, and a lot of people lost money there, but like it does still continue to happen. And, um, uh, you know, not your keys, not your points. They have to be cognizant of how much you leave on exchanges. I think it's kind of impossible to not, if you want an on and off ramp, like there's some risk that at some point you'll, you'll more than likely face, um, but you just try to minimize that risk. But, but, you know, I was affected by it. Um, and I wanted to see if I could help. So my way of, of doing that was, you know, initially disseminating information. And then eventually I applied um, and was interviewed to be on the committee to represent all affected users. And then eventually the inspector kind of directing the bankruptcy. Um, I think it's been super informative, uh, especially in how regulations um, ended up coming out in Canada. Uh, it's very custody based and, and a large part of that, I think, you know, unfortunately, we were a case study of exactly what not to do. Like he had no mm. records, no <clears throat> books. Like he, it, it's so hard for the CRA, which is currently doing an audit, to try to figure out like what did he do? He 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 caused um what is it F- fake trading? There's a term for that that I'm is missing right now. Wash um, trading. Wash trading. Yes. At one point, he was doing ninety percent of all volume was just his trades. Like he was making it look like there was a huge volume, so that everyone's like, "Hey, I'm going to go there. There's great liquidity." Um, and so, you know, there was a lot of fraud that happened. So I think, Magdalena, I have a question. What was his death ever like? One hundred percent confirmed? No, unfortunately. So one of the things that we directed. Um, uh, the, the council that represents all users to do was to send a letter to the RCMP to um, to basically requesting an autopsy and, and to dig up the body. Uh, and um, uh, as far as I know, uh, like, like uh, most of the investigation is confidential to everyone, like police to, and the FBI do what they what they do. So as far as I know, it hasn't been dug up, um, but it's something that if we were to pursue, it'd be very costly. And at this point, like it's not going to recover money. So you kind of have to pick and choose, you know, what you're going to pay for because these, you know, these professionals like lawyers and, and EY are very expensive. So we want to maximize the amount of money that goes back to victims. 
Hey, by the way, for whatever it's worth, I know some people in India. So if you guys need some help, let me know. Inspector. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I'm serious. I want to you know, ask you questions about India. Like exactly. That's Nobody's asked me. Nobody's asked me, even though I met Gerald. <laughs> we'll leave that oh, one for another yeah. story. No, no, I mean, yeah. like, generally, like, they're banning. Oh, 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 oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I, yes. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> he, he came up and introduced himself to me. I remember back in, like, 2014 or something. Oh, yeah? Initial yeah. impression? Long story short, uh... The, like the two guys or whatever there's two of them um they just told me that that they essentially they told me the story of how they met and okay. essentially they went into this like i don't know how but they just kind of ended up telling me how they were both like i i don't even want to even talk negative about people that we okay. don't even that we don't even know whether they're dead or not to be honest with you that oh, might be sitting on two okay. billion dollars but because in, in the sense that i'm scared <laughs> um but but i will say let's just put it this way they they told me pretty much straight blank that they were not the best of people and uh and that's why you know i've been doing events in toronto since since forever and i've never had them as sponsors i've never sent them my my passport because they the two founders literally told me and you know my approach was always like sunny if you don't you know believe that they're doing good things just stay away and just do your own thing I mean, I kind of regret it. I kind of regret it. I'm not going to lie. I kind of regret not being more like kind of, you know, more like, uh, what's the word? Like, uh, like outward about my opinion, but you know, it's hard, right? Like it's, you don't want to be like, oh, whatever. Hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. We, as an industry, I think need to, to, um, we've seen this happen so many times. I think we need to call people out. If we see something that's off, I think it's important to protect consumers. Um, because I've heard some really sad stories from Quadriga and um, like, I, I, I don't want to see that happen again. I was really happy when, you know, we launched, um, I helped launch, um, to help with the initial public offering of 3IQ's Bitcoin fund and, and that, you know, is much more professionally run, qualified custodian um, and, and, it, and, 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 and even users that maybe don't, aren't ready yet to custody their own keys. Like just giving them more options, I think is so good for Canadians. Now we have an ETF, which has even lower fees, like management fees, Um, it trades more continuously. I'm just so happy there's more options for people to to first like get a little bit of Bitcoin. Cause I think that's the really important part is you need to get a little bit, bit of it and that's kind of the step that takes you down this big rabbit hole um, of Bitcoin. So, I mean, so Magdalena, so, okay, 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 by the way, like we kind of literally just started like ripping on all these crazy topics, but let's just back up a little bit. Um, I wanted to actually- I'm a, I'm a monkey brain where I hop from branch to branch. <laughs> yeah, you're worse than me. Okay, so what I was going to say is that, uh, w- okay, first of all, I usually start with where did we meet? <laughs> That's oh, my first oh, question. Okay. Do you yeah. remember? Uh, I don't. I, think I can't I- remember. I think I messaged you and I'm like, Hey, Sunny, could we, could we have a coffee? Could we meet? And I think we met, um, in Toronto, just at a little cafe. And I think that's, that might be it. In 2017, 18, 17, 18. Okay. So you've been kind of like in and around the Bitcoin space for quite some time now. Yeah. So I got involved in 2017, you know, it's funny because it's like, number go up and that's what makes people pay attention and so initially i was like oh yeah sure what's this you know let's let's throw some money in bitcoin i, I don't want to be left out it's it just went from a thousand to three what <laughs> and so so that's how my story started but actually like but like i said that's that little spark because then you know i actually so it's not as sexy as for some people but um I remember just like there was a kind of a pivotal moment of where I started to really think like there's something here when, you know, you stand in line to wire money for like 20 minutes, you pay like $35 and you're like, and then afterwards you send some Bitcoin from one account to another. And it, it it's just like, it's fast. And it's like, whoa, there's, there's some magic here. Like well, what's going on? And then you really start to dive in and then you quit your job in government and your golden handcuffs and you decide to join this industry. Um, it's funny because for a while, my parents were like, 
oh, are you sure you want to do this? Especially with this bear market that lasted almost three years. They were, you know, they were concerned. They're like, you gave up your government pension and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, I believe in this. It was so, really so, 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 I asked you where, when we met, um, which was 2017. Uh, okay. okay. And then the second, next question, which you're kind of already diving into, which is really kind of the point of the show, which is like, what's your story? Uh, so story curious. What, 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 what? I'm doing this for you. I'm both the- Yeah, I shouldn't have given you the heads up at the beginning. It was too much of a prep. Now you're just like, oh, okay. But anyway, so so, so what's your what's your story is kind of my, like I said, I'm trying to capture that because uh, mainly because like, you know, Bitcoin is nothing more than like ones and zeros. And it's really like the people and our stories that kind of culminate together to create, you know, what is Bitcoin in my view, right? And yeah. so that's why, and I know, I feel like nobody's really doing this. I mean, I, I'd yeah, love for more people to do it, um, but I'm, I'm on episode 80 or something, 90 yeah. or something. And I'm trying to just, like I said, uh, ask people their story. So we, I don't know where it begins for you. Maybe when you're a girl, maybe a little girl, maybe when you were in school yeah. or maybe, I don't know, before you were born, but, but yeah, the floor is yours. Bring it back to my grandma, because I think that forms an important part of the story. So my grandma's actually turning 101 um, on the 21st. So that's three days from now. So yeah, I know, right? Wow. <laughs> the 100 was a big one. She got, you know, like Trudeau, uh, our prime minister, she got a letter, she got a letter from the queen and also really? the Pope. <laughs> I mean, I have to apply for all of them, but still, that's pretty freaking cool. Um, Amazing, and so my, cool. My grandma grew up um, in Poland and so did I. I was born in Poland before I came here. And um, that's actually part of the other story. And so we, you know, she, she grew up through two wars. Um, she lost her first husband. Um, it was sent to a camp in Russia and, and he was executed. Um, and then when the second uh, world war, um, you know, she was a little bit older and she, well, she tells me these crazy stories of like, you know, hiding out in her basement and bombs falling. And then every now and then there would be the siren and they'd know to go there and like watching her friend, you know, uh, get killed by gunfire, those kind of stories. Like they're, they're pretty, um, you know, I think that what some of our uh, family members, where they grew up is so very different from where we live. And, and I know it still happens in parts of the world. And so I think the important part there though, is after the war, like she had these, uh, she and her family had this beautiful land, like the soil, she would just tell me about like the, the lush gardens, like the incredible size of like, she'd be carrying shields uh, sorry, um, sunflowers that were like shields, you know, she's like, she was telling me how big and, and lush everything was. And so um, when the war ended, the borders got moved and that land was no longer Poland, so she lost it. And that's kind of something that takes me back when I think of Bitcoin as hmm. unseizable property that I own, you know, that, that, and, and something that you can pass on to your, you know, your family. It's kind of like generational assets that your family can own. Um, I think that that's an important part of what makes my story, um, you know, like, and, and, I, in, and you see, you know, what they work towards, what the family has built, and then, you know, it disappear. You know, that hits hard, especially when she recollects these amazing memories and just kind of the type of life she left. Um, so, so I think that's an important part. And then the second part too is, so we grew up in communism and Poland um, when I was born, you know, my parents would tell me stories about having this big lineup uh, around Christmas time for like three days to get a ham. You know, if when they got married, their neighbors, they all cut and, and friends got together and they had like like tickets for for different types of items that they could go and redeem them. So people kind of collected them ahead of the wedding and then, you know, to be able to hold like a wedding party. So it was a very hard time to live through. And then my parents escaped Poland as refugees, but even telling me how, you know, they crossed the border is an interesting story because first of all, someone messed up and gave the whole family passports. And usually they didn't do that because that meant the whole family could leave. Usually you issue it to one or two people, but not all three. And so the lady at the border, like, she's kind of like, oh, hey, you know, what are you guys doing? And then my dad's like, oh, we're just going for a vacation. And the lady like looks at all the luggage and she, she knows she's like, you know, and, my, and, my, and, my, and like there's people standing around with guns and they're like, are they going to start shooting? Like, 
they know and she knew and she's like just go <laughs> and I was like that's such a pivotal moment of where you end up right and I mean you didn't know where Poland was going to end up um, where it is now and they've come a far a long way economically after communism fell but it's just like you know what it, it's interesting to see that like that my family kind of went through these tough times and, and I think I feel pretty privileged to be where I am but I can understand like you know crossing borders with all your belongings um and and I see how that relates to bitcoin right and in terms of like maybe they, they could have had stuff confiscated they didn't so we got lucky there but that happens to refugees or you know having land seized so so I think that forms part of that story that is crazy that's fascinating you know um I'm so glad you brought that up or, or <laughs> but first in the sense that like, I didn't know that first of all, uh, that's, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, I've been kind of like heads down with this whole Bitcoin thing, like just like for 10 years, almost like just Bitcoin all day, yeah. all, every day. But I don't know, very recently, actually, Magdalena, like I'm talking like, like a, maybe a couple weeks, I've been just trying to like understand the world, you know, a bit better yeah. because I, Bitcoin was kind of like, um, what's the, what's the word? Like an ejection seat, you know, like a parachute, uh, like a, you know what I mean? Right. Like an escape, fire insurance, that, an like a fire insurance. Seat. I don't know. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's like a, yeah, it's like a way to opt out and it's beautiful. It's peaceful. It's math driven, you know, it's like, oh, it's just marvelous. But, but, now that NGU, right? Now that so many Number people goes. have, now that so many people are Bitcoiners around We're the world, <laughs> right? Are, are, are kind of like making it, if you will. I, I can't help yeah. but feel that, the, 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 that it's kind of our responsibility, our duty to be like, wait, but okay, just because Bitcoin's working doesn't necessarily mean that the world is. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I also think that it's, you know, I, anyway, so, um, and so I've been learning a lot about communism and, you know, kind of like what it means and, 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 you know, the cold war, like a lot of people don't like, we don't think about it because we're kind of, you know, well, we're, we're just, you know, we didn't really face it. It was like our parents or like our grandparents, but it's like, that was a real thing, like the, the fight for freedom and, and North America being this kind of like this last bastion of hope um, is like a real thing. And, and, and there are obviously like communist countries all over the world that are trying yeah. to see that that doesn't happen. Right. And, and we still look at, you know, like the data wars. Right. And, yeah. and maybe we're not like fighting with real physical weapons, but we're fighting, you know, governments are trying to hack each other, steal information cause election problems right so it's a different type of war and yeah. hey point yeah. is digital so look at that that's some i think in some ways i think it will fit in um it, it you know it, it, it it's bound to infiltrate more and more sectors mm -hmm. yeah, yeah 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 so anyway so i'm kind of like being a bit uh guarded about my comments but let's let's go back to your story uh okay so so about yeah no anyways sorry <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, okay, that that's okay, obviously okay. That, that that's forcing me to think about things deeply, yeah. right? M much more deeply than just like NGU or whatever, whatever, yeah. right? I, I yeah. do think a lot about, I'm not gonna lie, I think about geopolitics now, which is something that I, yeah. I just kind of didn't care at all, didn't want to be a part of it. But then as I look at it, like through the lens of not like, idealism, but like through the lens of like pragmatism, like just reality, yeah. like, okay, like, this is something that like, obviously affects all of our lives whether we like to think about it or not um and and where where what, what's our role in that right and and, yeah. and 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 what i will say is that for the last few weeks i've it's kind of like the matrix like i feel like i'm waking up to <laughs> whoa like it's, you know it's and it's interesting because we <laughs> talk to some people and um you do get like you're in a cult <laughs> kind of a mentality and or they maybe they listen to like the have fun staying poor meme and don't have the full background or the whole just like the conviction that we have but i think part of that conviction comes from as a bitcoiner you're forced to dive into so many things that you didn't think you had to like macroeconomic factors like i didn't really pay attention just similar to the you what you were you were just talking about like I didn't think about these things until really last year where I had to do a super big deep deep dive to fully understand it you know things like shadow banking and the dollar like it, it uh, and money printing and all these kind of concepts 
um, in addition to obviously like economics and, and game theory. And it really forces you to, to learn, um, you know, about more and more of these topics um, so that you are better informed. But that's part of why, you know, people, we kind of get the stronger conviction because we understand how Bitcoin can fit into that part of the world. And I think it's great too that we're getting these macroeconomic thinkers um, more on our side that aren't traditionally from Bitcoin to better explain the value proposition. Magdalena, what what are your, I mean, and by the way, like I, I was telling you earlier, right? Like I don't really have an agenda. This, 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 yeah, it's just, just more talking. like talking about things, right? Um, but but I'm just very curious because as someone, like you said, who, and I don't get to talk to people every day that that just said that, you know, that they that they were, were born and raised, did you say, in in a country where communism was a thing? Yeah, so I was what, born what, and raised I, in Poland, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I find that a lot of people in North America, especially like people like myself who kind of bore, were born and raised here, we don't really understand what like communism really is. It's like this idea that we kind of read about yeah. in social studies or whatever. And it's kind of a bad thing maybe, but it sounds good on the surface, you know, everybody, yay. Like, so, but, but for, as somebody <laughs> who kind of lived in there. The okay, so yeah. I want you to break that apart a little bit, like tease it apart, like what is going on there and why is it maybe not the best thing? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, first of all, hard for me to say in terms of personal experience, because I was, you know, from zero to um, about five years of age where I grew up. So, you know, as a child, you don't really pay as much attention to these kinds of things. It's more just the stories that your family afterwards tells you about how hard it is to get any kind of goods. And, and I think so kind of from my own sort of personal reflection, what, what, what we experienced in communism was, you know, maybe it was like market forces aren't allowed to be efficient. You know, the government controls everything, including, you know, supply of goods um, and, um, and, and that kind of disrupts the way that markets would traditionally operate. Not to say that markets are 100% efficient, because there's a lot of externalities that happen, for example, environmental problems um, that typically haven't been priced in, for not just necessarily carbon. But, um, but the point is that we've seen a lot of societies, like the idea is, is great, you know, that everyone is kind of equal. Um, you know, I've heard, uh, you know, for example, like a doctor maybe makes the same kind of wage as as like a cleaner in some countries. But but the but the but the main point is um, that w what we've seen happen has not been successful. So and, and that might just be because of corruption, like maybe the ideal. I, I don't know, like why, you know, 100 percent conclusively why it's not successful. We just know it doesn't work. Um, and so, yeah. You're on mute, Sunny. Sorry. Yeah. I wanted to make sure, you know, we got your audio there. <laughs> um, no, I'm kidding. I uh, no, no, no. I agree. I agree. I, so the empirical evidence just doesn't mm -hmm. add up. Right. Um, anyways, I have some thoughts around that. Okay. But, but let's, let's keep moving on. So what does your story look like? So you come here, uh, you know, I mean, and, and that story you told about, like, even at the border, you know, men with guns yeah. and not knowing whether you get to even take your belongings with you or not. I think also really kind of speaks to the heart of like what is communism right it's like uh, oh 100 percent yeah um, so, you know um things uh, like if you know typically the state can is a lot stronger it can confiscate assets um and so even at, but at the border too whether it's the state taking something um for example i've, I've read stories uh, more recently about refugees coming um, uh, to Europe and some of the European countries were actually confiscating some of the assets to help pay for, you know, um, you know, food and shelter, obviously not things like wedding rings, but still like, you know, you expect you're, you're hoping to, to go to a better place and then they take your assets. But at the same time, there's a lot of, you know, corrupt border guards who like, okay, we'll only let you through if you give us the money that you have. Right. And so you're trying to make this fresh start and it's, it's a lot harder for you. Um, so we, we were fortunate that we were able um, to uh, uh, to leave, um, and you know my my family thought that was the best uh, decision at the time. We moved to Germany for two years. We were officially refugees, and then we got sponsored to Canada. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm grateful because I think you know parents usually do it for their kids. Um, so I think I, I had a good childhood. I was able to um, you, you know like 
I think I'm fairly successful if, if you look at it. So it, from that perspective, it worked. But it, it always makes you think like, well, what would happen if I stayed in Poland? Because Poland is doing really well now. Um, you know, they actually, you know, one of the, I think, um, even looking at their GDP and economically, they're they're one of the top European countries. Oh wait, so they're no longer a communist no, country. No, no. Right? So, so it actually they, ended about just, two or three. Because a lot of might not know what, when, yeah. when, when, when. So so, so um, it was in the uh, I think 89, 1989. So it ended shortly after, but you don't know how long it's going to last, right? Of so course. you kind of make that decision. So they've been, um, you know, regular. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, so they went from second world to, to first world. Um, uh, they got rid of communism because they let. Yeah, they the, did. They did. Mm. Yeah. And what are they now? They're like more socialist or more like liberal. Well, actually, no. The current government is super conservative. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's it's very similar to the U.S. like Republicans, right? You know, like right. The abortion. They put in some really strong laws that like huge, huge protests. Um, one of the strictest, you know, abortion laws that very religious country. Um, but I think they've been doing the right things when it comes to, you know, innovation and economics and supporting their sectors to the extent that, you know, po um, polls used to go to like um, the UK and other countries to, to earn money and send it back to Poland. And, uh, and now people are coming back to Poland uh, just to work there because things are so much better. Magdalena, when we, yeah, uh, that's, that's, I, I agree. So I, on the note around communism though, do you, yeah. do you think about it much in the sense, like from a global position, like, do you, do you think communism does pose a threat to people maybe even living outside of communist countries? Um, and if so, is there, you know, kind of a point of focus that might be more worrisome than others? I think for me, it's more like, I, it, it's similar to religion. Like you can be religious if you want, just don't influence, you know, like, don't expect me to follow your religion. So I think it's similar, like, you know, if there's a country that's communist, and it's trying to push those ideals towards others, I think that's, you know, that's not something that's um, benefit, you know, that, that, that doesn't, that doesn't gel together. Um, and, and, but what I think, it, I, I'm not sure communism is necessarily the threat. Um, if you're, if you're talking more like about the, the kind of like a socialism ideal, I, the idea um, we can go kind of go on that tangent. Well, I, I just wondering like this communism does exist in the world today, though, does it not? It does, yeah. And so, I, I like think, maybe not in North America, but well, yeah, not in North of... America and in, in Asia, right? I think for me, the bigger concerns are things like surveillance and and you know privacy and mm. just you know how you function as a, as a member of society, right? And and how you're seen as a member of society, how much freedom do you have? I think we come from you know a country where we want our own personal freedom, we want our own sovereignty, and we don't want to be surveilled. And there's this huge backlash and pushback against you know Google and and Facebook. Um, so you know I think the pendulum is swinging the other way, and maybe it'll swing too far. And you know it always kind of goes from one end to the other. Um, but I think those are kind of bigger threats, is what I see. Cool. So what is? I, yeah, no, I agree. So what, what's your story? I guess after that, so. Like, yeah, did you, no, I mean, uh, I yeah. Canada, uh, it's not, not, I can't say there's any like super exciting things there. Um, you know, I, I, I went to university for, um, I, I studied some business, um, economics as well, and, um, and environmental science. Um, so I, I think that always kind of fascinated me. The market, the market, um, more about like carbon finance or, or public or like public economics, those kind of things, like market based systems. Um, and then for my master's, I, I did engineering, but I really focused on um, a carbon life cycle assessment and, and kind of carbon finance types of, of areas. And that kind of led me to my first job in government where I worked on how do we transition Ontario to a low carbon economy. So that's, you know, how do we green our industry? And a lot of these things are so similar now thinking about it to Bitcoin mining, you know, because it's, it's yes, it's an industry, but we're trying to decarbonize our whole economy, right? If we have a steel plant or a cement plant, and I used to love facility tours of like these, these kinds of, um, you know, industrial sites, seeing, for example, an electric arc furnace where you're basically making lightning indoors, like it's so freaking cool. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I worked in the area of government where it was kind of, it's the strategy setting area, right? So, you know, how do we, 
come up with initiatives that create the right incentives for industry to decarbonize. And a lot of that really had to do with energy because energy is the largest input, but it also has the biggest carbon input. So it was, you know, designing programs like cap and trade in Canada. Um, and then also the, the funds that would come from cap and trade. So $5 billion per year, 2 billion towards businesses, how to recycle those throughout the economy to incentivize you know, more companies to either reduce their energy use or, or, or switch fuels, that kind of thing. So I think it was really fascinating just working um, in, in that area, um, you know, talking to various stakeholders, uh, bringing them together. And, um, and I think I learned a lot and, and, and just, it's, it's really interesting, especially um, this last month or two, you know, with Elon Musk, who's super known for being so green when he put, um, you know, $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin on his balance sheet of Tesla, just seeing so many articles saying that Bitcoin is killing the planet and being like, hey, I used to do this. <laughs> Let's talk, right? Like, I think just, just like traditional, you know, industry, just PR, everything is PR, right? Everything is like, how do you take the data? And sometimes it's the wrong kind of data that people focus on and, and, and it's really harmful. Um, but those are the things that make headlines. So I think, you know, looking more forward, where can I add value in this industry? I think it's kind of helping to talk about green Bitcoin or sustainable Bitcoin. Um, and, and I do see that's kind of where the industry is leading. Sorry, I know I kind of went all over the place. There. Okay. Uh, no, no, I was going to say, do you know, do you know who, oh, I don't even know what his name is. Is it S.G. Barber or something like this guy? Barber. Yeah, I know Steve. And then you do know him. Okay, yeah, I've been kind of uh, and, and Denver Bitcoin. So, what, what are doing your thoughts? What are your thoughts about what they're doing? Because I, I'm yeah, kind of, so I'm think, not gonna lie, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty interested. <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, basically, they are helping reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Um, because what they're doing is, so when you have an oil and gas field and you're an oil and gas producer, um, in order to access the oil, there is gas that usually typically gas is um, on top of the oil sitting in caverns and they, it needs to be vented to be able to access the oil. And um, that gas is natural gas, which is nothing. And nothing is 24 to 25 times more potent greenhouse gas, so 25 times worse, depends on which standard you look at, um, than, than methane. So typically these producers, they burn it. Um, but it's just like energy that's kind of in a sense being wasted because they, they don't need that natural gas. It's not very economic to collect it because you know all these sites are very distributed. But I think what these guys have done is, um, is very smart is they've set up mobile miners that have that that have turbines that can generate energy, um, and they actually, um, you know, they burn the methane to make it into a less potent greenhouse gas. So there is a positive greenhouse gas impact. And um, my understanding is that these uh, the the uh, the turbines that they're using, like a natural gas generator, it it um it does a better job of. Uh, burning um, because they have kind of like better environmental controls, uh, the actual equipment. And, and also during, um, for example, when, when it's really windy, a lot of the methane just gets, it, it doesn't combust properly. So, so, you know, so, so I think, you know, that's the kind of stories that we need, uh, you know, to be put forward because, you know, Bitcoin isn't just, you know, it, it's not killing the environment. It's, we have some really cool, actually, even in Canada. So for example, there's another company called make green and what they're doing is they're taking the heat from miners and they're heating buildings um so it's not be, the heat isn't being wasted super it, cool it's my favorite part is they are what they're helping boil the ocean <laughs> no they are they're literally boiling the ocean because there's an artisanal sea salt company that normally evaporates the water to leave the salt behind that they then sell in stores and so they're they're building um an immersion cooling system that is going to, that is the currently they're they're going to pipe the heat um to uh to um the, the the sea salt vats and evaporate the water and so you know so that 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 energy is being put to use it's not being wasted you know at, typically you know these mining sites just spent it they're also setting up in a whiskey um, uh, next door to the sea salt company is a whis whiskey uh, distillery. So they're going to be heating the mash with Bitcoin miners. So I think there's some really cool opportunities um, to 
to recycle energy in not in all applications and kind of like low grade speed but the point is we're being really smart about our energy we're not just letting it waste and bend um and i think like there's opportunities too for example um let's say you're up north uh, you have a community that's not maybe grid connected, you're using diesel. Um, if you build some sort of generation that's subsidized by Bitcoin mining, that helps out the community. But on the uh, but but also what I can see really happening, and I know there are sites that are already growing fruits and vegetables, they're taking that heat to um, and piping it to uh, greenhouses. And, and so, so for example, in a Northern community, you could grow fresh fruit and vegetables. And, and I don't know if you've ever seen the prices of these Northern communities for fre fresh fruits and veggies. Like they have food scarcity, like we're talking $15 for an apple. Like it's, it's really, really bad. So I think, you know, there, there's things where it improves the economics. Oh yeah. Like Google, like, uh, like a qualiate or none of it, like food prices like it's it's just shocking i have a friend <laughs> i have a friend who lives in nunavut and uh, ask him how much his groceries are i mean they get they get subsidized heavily by government um but actually really interesting too so for, for example in ontario most of the food like production last i looked at the stats um a few years ago it they used coal and um and 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 uh, and, and bunker fuel, which is like some of the dirtiest fuels. And the reason farming can do that is because the environmental regulations are a lot um, less stringent because it's food production. Everybody needs food, right? And the farmers have a strong lobby, yada, yada, yada. So what's interesting there is let's say you set up a miner and you vented the heat, right? Because these greenhouses need heat. So you're venting the heat from a miner that's maybe using electricity off the grid, you're actually greening that operation. So I think there's lots of good news stories that we can see there. Never mind the whole fact that like, you know, we can use renewables and we can ba help balance the grid and, and there's there's all sorts of opportunities there. Um, but uh, I think there's, you know, this, these kind of stories need did to you, come out. Did you hear about the mine in Nunavut? No, there's a Bitcoin mine in none of it. No, 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 no. About there's there's a big protest right now about uh, trying no. to prevent uh, the doubling of a mine. Just it was last week. They were they had uh, driven their I think their ATVs or whatever onto the airport oh, wow. uh, tarmac in in protest of it, and uh, and it's kind of sad actually. Not 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 a lot is being done to be honest. In fact, um, what kind of mine is it? Like one that's like a, a strip mine where they're taking resources out or. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Then they're building a railway out, and and uh, okay. so they can take it out of uh, the country. Anyways, but I, but I, I that, but on the point of uh, just like gen generally speaking, you know, the northern part of Canada, mm -hmm. that's another one of those things that again, it was like a social study exercise when I was like a kid, but more recently, I'm like, oh my god, like what, like what is the history of Canada? Like, yeah. do you know what? Do you know what the Indian Act is? Um, it's me. 80 pages long, but it was essentially the act that uh, when people colonialized uh, Canada, yeah. essentially put forward. And, um, you know, more recently, the United Nations has also come out with a lot of um, kind of guidance around uh, how the Indigenous people should be treated and whatnot. And, yeah. and I think there's, a, I don't know exactly what's going on, but it, to me, it feels like there's a lot of... Um, I ho hopefully like movement in that direction or at least recognition yeah, more needs to be seen, done. yeah there's been in canada a large push towards reconciliation mm. um i mean it, it it's it's one of you know it, it's similar situation where you know people came in and they took the land and um I, in some ways you know it was like a trade and and what they thought they were giving up wasn't maybe worse in in, in the end um, and, and that's maybe uh, one of those imperfect information in a market kind of situations. But, you know, it, it is sad to see that um, I remember I used to do some public policy around low income consumers and looking at the statistics for northern communities. When you look at averages, uh, average salaries, it was the, like the lowest um, salaries were in indigenous communities throughout Ontario. So just like just looking at you know how how it's it's so unequal and and i don't know if it you know it's one of those self-perpetuating things where i know there's a lot of people that are depressed um and and f f you know maybe they're losing their cultural heritage or um it's just I, I think it's a situation you know when you're in a tough spot it's not easy to to get out so it's almost self-perpetuating um but you're right it's a very sad situation
Mm, yeah, yeah. No, I've been, like I said, I've been digging deeper into it. Um, I think it's a very, very important thing. And I don't think, again, like, you know, I'm a Bitcoiner. I talk about ones and zeros programming NGU, right? But <laughs> like I said, more recently, I've been waking up to the fact that yeah. the world isn't as it seems, you know what I mean? Like, and yeah. I think, I think it needs people that think like us, like Bitcoiners, like adversarially that think deeply that think, you know, not just surface level. Oh, I saw this on the news, but I do see a lot happening around the world that, that pains me, that, that gives me a lot of, you know, just like, like, really, like, this is what's up. Like, and, and the yeah. more I learn yeah. about it, you know, and, and like, I was listening to like interviews between, you know, some of these people that, kind of represent that the voice of, of Inu people kind of debating, if you will, like more yeah. the academic people kind of talking about, you know, assimilation essentially and how they need to like, you know, get with the times. But then when you hear their perspective too, they talk about just looking at the world differently, like not yeah. through the eyes of necessarily like, um, you know what I mean? Just like the free market necessarily or whatever, yeah. or like, uh, or like the gun uh, per se. It's like, they talk about things like truth and honor and the environment and spirituality, which I think yeah, for, for modern people, it's like, ah, that doesn't matter, but mm, yeah. maybe it does. Maybe it does. They've been here for thousands of years. We've just come, and they're connected like we, I mean, them. like, our, you know, or even yeah. a hundred years. So, so I, I feel like no one's actually kind of bridged that gap. No one's sat in between and truly honestly said, okay, what is your perspective? What yeah. is your per perspective? And like, hey, let's try and figure out how to get through this. It's still to this day, when you hear at least on YouTube and just the brief conversations, it feels like they're literally talking two different languages. Sorry, I'm kind of going off on a tent. Yeah, Bet you didn't no, think we were going to talk about communism and all this. <laughs> I think it's important to say, though, too, that like, you know, one of our Bitcoin or mantras was Bitcoin fixes this and it's not going to fix everything. Right. It's it's you know, it's not going to fix that inequity. In some cases, maybe it can help. Um, but I think, you know, I've, I've talked to Bitcoiners that have been in Venezuela that lived and escaped Venezuela. And it's not like, yes, it helped them escape, but it's not going to solve everything. But at mm. the same time, I think it's important to share these stories. And I, and I really like what. Um, you know, Alex Gladstein is about, he's a, uh, um, he's um, CSO, I think, of the Human Rights Foundation. And he just tells some amazing stories of how Bitcoin is helping, again, not fixing everything, but where it can, you know, maybe in terms of protests for totalitarian governments or help get medical supplies uh, to Venezuela. Like, I think it's, it's, it, it is helping and it's so good to hear these kind of stories that we are able to help in some way. Mm. I've been reading um, a lot about this too recently, and I've been reading about the Cold War, you know, something that I, you know, again, social studies type of deal, forget it. But more recently, it's like, what was that about? And, you know, what was happening? I don't read any more books. Like, uh, it's so hard, like in this ADD world where everyone's checking your phone to just, I remember when I was younger, it'd be like, Harry Potter book just came in, stay up till 4 a.m. reading, right? Like, I think it, it gets harder for us as adults to sit down, but there's so many books that I keep hearing um, about these days that I'm like, I really need to read this one and, and that one, like kind of like history of money and, and, and all sorts of things to like help me better understand and contextualize things. It's so hard to sit down though. <laughs> I know, I know. Trust me, it's hard. Um, I was going to say my takeaway though, kind of like my TLDR of kind of reading all this and going down these deep rabbit holes was is that freedom prevailed, um, you know, during the Cold War, right? Mainly because of there was a kind of this like laser focus on three things. First was the three things are protect, build, and inspire. So protect, right? And if you think about protect, protecting your time, your money, your kids, your family, your country, your your neighborhood, I don't know, protecting, protecting yourself, right? Protecting individuals, right? Not protecting, not creating a firewall around the whole country, but like protecting individuals against potential state actors that are coming against them right yeah. on the other sides of the world um protect second is is they built right like it, it, there's all these fascinating stories around how like the united states did the calculations on it and they were like to prevent a nuke for every dollar that the russians would spend they'd have to spend seven oh so when they did the math on it they were like wait so it's like a losing game meaning we can spend as much money as we want and they're just gonna have to just spend one and we're gonna go bankrupt so they said, instead of spending money on like bombs and all that, why don't we instead focus on building, you know, and the internet revolution, whether it's like everything that's happened, I think was kind of spiraled out of that. And the last one was, 
inspire, right? So it's like, like America is kind of losing its way, right? But, but I mean, there are people though, I think that are super woke and Bitcoiners are becoming the new America, if you will. Um, but I think, I think, I think there's this like, like if we can ins- like, you know, protect those that we love and ourselves and whatever, right? And I think Bitcoin is kind of perfect for that. If we can build, uh, in my view, on top of Bitcoin, right? More solutions to help people and then inspire people. You know what I mean? Like people within communist regimes, even uh, people without young people. I feel like like most of them don't have the time to even research this stuff. So it's like if we can break it down for them, yeah, I think yeah, that I could be a formula. Inspired. Like things like GameStop and and <laughs> to fucking value. Like he was inspiring to kind of millennials, and mm. like he did much more than Occupy Wall Street. Um, just that whole movement, and so I think. It's interesting to see um, how Inspire is coming, you know, around, around like the financial system and, and making people understand. Um, yeah. I know it's not as nice as like human rights inspiring, but I think we have to find our wins, right? Yeah. Hey, Magdalena, you know, I feel like we could do this like once a week and and <laughs> not run out of shit to say, you know, it's like, it's so much fun talking to you, but I am, we are reaching kind of the end of the time we had allotted. And I wanted to give you a little bit of time to also plug, you know, whether it's your Twitter handle, like websites, I don't know, whatever, I don't know, YouTube, yeah, sure. whatever you're up to nowadays. Um, and then, like I said, is if you want, we could do this kind of a follow-up next yeah, week, next month, follow-up. next year, whenever you want. <laughs> yeah. So just a few quick things. I'm, I'm, um, on Twitter, crypto underscore mags. Careful, there are now, I suddenly, I now get spammers that are asking people for money. I would never ask you for money. So just to put that out there, it's so frustrating seeing that happen. Um, so a few things I'm involved in, I'm available for consulting. Um, uh, you know, I have energy, um, carbon expertise can help. So if you're kind of like, if you're a miner and you need help with that, um, that's, that's one area. Uh, strategy, business development's another. Um, helping kind of translate Bitcoin to the current world, for example, with 3IQ, um, you know, talking to bankers, uh, helping them understand, you know, the value proposition when we were launching the fund. Um, you, were, we also, you were part of 3IQ, right, in some way? Because we didn't yeah, really talk yeah, about that. Really what was your role offer. there? You were a consultant for them and you were yeah, helping them. for them. So I was helping with the initial public offering, with the roadshow. Cool. Um, Helping talk, just will basically translate Bitcoin into the legacy world, right? So we're talking to all the advisors there and, and answering questions. And I mean, they ask all sorts of things, like just like a newbie would ask, right? Um, even on energy impacts, like. <laughs> and so, um, and the other thing too is, so I'm under MetaMesh, M E T A M E S H. Uh, so they're through consulting, but also we have been really diving into. Um, multimedia. I mean, with COVID, everyone kind of needs an online strategy. So, so we can help you with, um, you know, tell your story online. Um, and we've been working with some of the Canadian and, and international Bitcoin companies. We do multiple languages, so content in, in English or in Spanish. And our sister site is um, BTC in Espanol, the longest Spanish speaking Bitcoin education channel. Um, so, so check that out if you have family that's Spanish that, you know, and we're starting to create content, like educational content for for breaking things down, really simple to understand on MetaMesh, uh, uh, our MetaMesh channel. Um, but we're just starting. So, so patience, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, uh, the, the more people that put out quality content, um, it it is good because there's a lot of really bad, you know, flashy, like make money now versus <laughs> that's not necessarily the right kind of approach. Yeah, yeah, I know. Couldn't agree more. Uh, there was going to be something I was going to say. Oh, just get my mind. But I think that's okay. Uh, okay, so let's let's maybe bring it to a close. This has been this has been fun. This has been awesome. And uh, okay, just stick around for a few seconds though. I'm going to kill All this. Right, thanks for here. having me on. Yeah.